everyone. Um, we're going to be benchmarking this CPU today, the Celeron G1610T. If I can get the light not reflecting on it. But yeah, we're going to be testing the Celeron G1610T today. Now, the G1610T, it was identical to the G1610 Celeron processor, which released on the same day in January 2013 with the exception being that it ran at a lower frequency and a lower voltage. Now, the reason Intel did this, as they have done with their other T-series processors, is to provide a more energy efficient alternative um, to the non-T processors. Now, running at a lower frequency and lower voltage reduces the power consumption, thus making it a bit more energy efficient at the cost of some performance. So just how does this trying to think of how old it is. Quick maths. Uh, this, it does this eight-year-old CPU um, perform in 2021. Well, let's fire into some benchmarks and find out. Before that though, the full seller on G1610 ran at a speed of 2.6 gigahertz, whereas the G1610T ran at 2.3. Both launched with an official price of only 42 US dollars, which is around 48 US dollars today, so not much difference. And along with the G1620, which ran at 2.7 GHz, these three CPUs were the first Celeron processors to be released that used the Ivy Bridge architecture, which is getting on a bit in terms of age now, but can still be of great use depending on your use case today. First up for the benchmarks is Cinebench R23, which is great for testing performance relative to other processors using all available cores in a processor. It is what is known as a tile-based rendering benchmark, meaning that it splits up an image into equally sized tiles and assigns a tile to each CPU core to render until it makes up the full image. And at the G1610T's stock clocks of 2.3 GHz, it managed an average score of 829 points. There are scores on the left-hand side of the screen for comparison that are built into the benchmark. Overclocking is where it gets a little bit tricky with this processor, as it isn't really supported at all. Processors derive their speed by multiplying the base clock by a certain number, but the multiplier is locked on the G1610T, and with very limited headroom on the base clock, there isn't really much you can do. Increasing the base clock from the standard 100MHz up to 105.7, the maximum the motherboard I'm using will boot at, this boosts the frequency up to 2.43 GHz, which also increases the speed of the RAM as well, as this also derives its speed from the same base clock that the processor does. This small increase in speed allows for a 5.87% increase in score to 877.67 points. So firing into the games, and first up is Crisis. The game released in 2007, notorious for how bad it ran on certain hardware. This was unfortunately a byproduct of how it was developed, meaning that even processors released today struggle to run it well. Overall, Crisis is playable on the G1610T at 1080p with the lowest settings, and it actually ran far better than I expected it to, at least up until you first get asked to use the binoculars during the island mission. From this point onwards, there is noticeable stuttering and brief hitches, with some of the hitches being pretty severe, but not so much that it ruins gameplay. The stuttering gets especially bad in the firefight you have amongst the buildings just before the Luskaz Call area of the map, where the stuttering is pretty significant, although it is far smoother, particularly at this bit with the overclock, which was surprising considering how little of an overclock it is. It doesn't by any means make things perfect, but it quite noticeably improves performance. GTA 5 was effectively unplayable at 1080p with the lowest settings. The game has severe issues with stuttering and hitches in gameplay throughout the map, but the most game-breaking issue was just how bad the texture and object popping was throughout the city during night and daytime. Large parts of the road simply didn't render in at all and even entire buildings could be missing. Some objects in the road would also be missing, meaning you would end up crashing into them because you can't actually see them. This issue disappeared once out of the city, but there is a large amount of noticeable hitching and stuttering throughout. 
the small overclock does improve things a little, however the game is still in an unplayable state. Grip Combat Racing, an indie game from 2018 and spiritual successor to the game Roll Cage, runs far better than I had expected it to, and this is at 1080p with epic settings enabled and any blur and anti-aliasing options turned off in the settings. There are only a couple of minor hitches throughout the first career tournament, and a couple of points where there is a small amount of minor stuttering, but as the game is so fast paced, you're unlikely to notice it much, if at all. Overall, the game runs fantastically and is great fun to play. The Adventure Pals is another indie game. It is a fun little adventure platformer developed by indie studio Massive Monster and published on PC by indie publisher Armour Games. How many more times can I fit indie into this intro I wonder? Hmm. Anyway, the game performed perfectly. This is down to the game being pretty simple and having a fixed maximum resolution of 1080p with very limited graphical settings. There was some slight stutter at points, however this is down to the game trying to keep the frame rate at the hard limit of 60 frames per second. The CPU usage, which you can see in the top left hand corner of the screen, barely got close to 50% throughout the entire test, so you could actually run this game on a much weaker processor. Finishing off with Rocket League, running at 1080p with the performance render detail graphics preset and high quality texture, world and particle details enabled within the settings as well. I've also enabled FXAA Low within the settings to deal with some of the jagged edges on the edges of textures in the game. Overall, the game is quite playable and enjoyable, with levels of stuttering depending on the arena you play in. For example, the Salty Shores arena has more noticeable stuttering than other areas, Forbidden Temple, on the other hand, while having a lower frame rate compared to Salty Shores, has less stuttering, and DFH Stadium performs the best out of the three of them, with only a small amount of stutter that you might not even notice. The overclock, while small, makes a noticeable improvement in the stuttering as well. That said though, the issues, while noticeable, don't affect the playability and enjoyability of the game, as it is actually still quite fun to play. So, the Celeron G1610T, a lower power version of the G1610, can still be used for some light gaming today. There will most likely be at least some stuttering, however it isn't going to ruin the enjoyability of the game. This is especially true if you stick to lesser known indie games such as Grip Combat Racing or The Adventure Pals. Otherwise, this kind of processor is more suited to esports titles or easier to run non AAA games. So I'd like to round out the video by thanking Patreon supporters Shadow in the Void and Matt Sterak for helping to make all of this possible. You should also be seeing a list of my other patrons on screen round about there, right about now. Um, if you enjoyed my look at the Celeron G1610T, a lower powered version of the Celeron G1610 processor released back in 2013 and would like to support me in creating more content like this, you can do so through the link on screen now at patreon.com forward slash benchytest, where from as little as $2 per month, you will also gain early access to all of my videos three days before the public do for as long as you remain a patron. If you would like to support me in creating these videos, but would prefer not to do so through a subscription kind of thing like Patreon, you can do so through the link on screen now at coffee.com forward slash benchytest. So yeah, hopefully you all enjoyed the video um, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.